Namotasabhagavato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Namotasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Namotasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa. Okay, good evening, everybody. And thank you all for coming out for this talk. And as uh, Aya Soma mentioned, this is a benefit talk for the Buddhist Insights, which is now based in Rockaway. But the lease, I think it's the lease on the Rockaway house, is now coming to an end. And so they are contemplating purchasing a church, is it a church, in West Orange? Yes. Okay, and so we're hoping to, that I understand that there's just a margin of 30,000 to be filled in order to complete the amount needed to make, the, is it the down payment? And so hopefully we can generate that amount tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I chose as a topic for the talk this evening, I call the theme Finding Joy in the Wholesome. And I think this is very, a very important aspect of Buddhist practice that's often overlooked by Westerners who come to the Dharma, since usually what initially attracts us, what initially attracts us when we become interested in Buddhism is the practice of meditation. And we seem to take meditation almost pulling it out of its deep roots. Is this a, is it a caffeinated tea or it's herbal tea? Okay. So we pull the practice of meditation out from its deep roots in the Dharma and treat it almost as something like a kind of autonomous or self-sufficient practice. And so when we'll start off with practices like mindfulness of breathing or vipassana insight meditation, which are really advanced practices. It's typical when people come to learn meditation. Of course, we're going to start them off with something which does not have any requirement of faith or commitment or belief with some kind of practice which is immediately visible, which one could start off from a completely neutral platform. And so what's usually recommended is mindfulness of breathing, to be aware of the in and out, in and out breathing. And also this is what I would teach myself to somebody who comes to, a, to the monastery, interested in Buddhism, and wants to start meditation. But for mindfulness of breathing to really bring its results, it requires a very, very strong foundation. And similarly, with the practice of insight meditation, for those practices to bring their intended results, it requires a strong basis, a strong foundation, and what we would call an abundant accumulation of good roots or wholesome qualities. Now there's a sutta, several suttas actually that occur in the Sangyutta Nikaya and in the Anguttara Nikaya where the Buddha traces the chain of conditions back from the final goal to the starting point. And so he starts with the ultimate goal of the teaching, which is the liberation of the mind and the knowledge of liberation. Then he traces back factor by factor, coming to more and more elementary factors, till we come to the knowledge and vision of things as they really are. That is the knowledge of insight, the insight knowledge. Then he inquires, what is the condition for the knowledge 
of things as they really are. The condition for that is samadhi. Samadhi means concentration of mind, the collection of mind, unification of mind. Okay, so when we start practicing anapanasati or insight meditation, we think that we can go directly from where we are at our starting point to samadhi. But when we look further into this chain of conditions, we see that there are other conditions that precede samadhi. And these are the bases for samadhi. And so from samadhi, the Buddha inquires, what is the supporting condition for samadhi, for concentration of mind? And then the answer that he gives is happiness that samadhi arises in a mind that is happy or a mind that is full of pleasure, full of bliss. And so in order to gain concentration, we can't force the mind using determination, sort of native grit, pushing the mind into samadhi, but we have to start with a mind that is full of happiness, full of pleasure, full of bliss. Okay, then the Buddha, again inquiring into the chain of conditions, how is it that the mind becomes happy? The mind becomes happy, he says, when it is tranquil. So tranquility or calmness is the condition for happiness for this pleasure, for this blissfulness of the mind. Okay, what is the condition? What is it that leads to the mind becoming tranquil, becoming calm and peaceful? The condition for this, he says, is, I use the Pali word here, piti, which means, we could say, delight. So when the mind is uplifted by delight, by elation, it will then move from this delight to tranquility, to calmness. Okay, then what is the condition for delight? The condition for delight is joy. So we have to make the mind joyful and from joy, when joy becomes intensified and strengthened, it turns into delight. When the mind is full of delight, it settles down and becomes calm. When the mind becomes calm, then it becomes happy and blissful. And when the mind becomes blissful, then it gains concentration, samadhi. Okay, but what is the condition for the mind to become joyful? And here, in different suttas, the Buddha gives different answers which have a common core. In one sutta, or several suttas, he says that the mind becomes full of this joy through the observance of sila, the observance of precepts, which I'll come back to a little later. In another sutta, and this I think is a more basic approach, he says that the mind becomes joyful through, I'll use the Pali word, sadda, which is what I translate as faith. And I'll come to an explanation of this. So for the Buddha, faith is the condition for joy to arise. And it is this joy that gives rise to delight, to tranquility, to happiness, to concentration. So this shows that for the Buddha, the starting point in wholesome qualities is sadda or faith. And so why is this the case? 
First, let's inquire, what is the meaning of this word that I translate as faith? The Pali word sadda. So the word sadda, because you see, in English the word faith, especially for people who come from rather dogmatic Christian traditions, has somewhat negative connotations. So one is accustomed to being told, you have to believe this, otherwise <laughs> it's down below. <laughs> At death, it's down below. You take the elevator, press the button down below, and then <laughs> when the elevator opens, it's hellfire. Okay, but sadda is not believing in certain propositions, taking them to be true or false, but rather the meaning of sadda is placing the heart with conviction in the Buddha as the fully enlightened teacher and placing trust in the Dhamma, the Buddha's teaching, as the path to realization and liberation, the path to enlightenment and liberation. And so this quality of faith arises in fact, there's one sutta where the Buddha says, what is the condition for faith to arise? And interestingly, he says, the condition for faith is suffering. So that's quite significant in understanding the particular nuance of sadda or faith. That faith arises out of the experience of suffering, through the encounter of suffering. So when we meet with suffering, whether really severe suffering or just annoying sense of discontent, disappointment, we then go in search of some way out of the suffering. Of course, for a lot of people, when they meet with suffering, the way they try to escape from suffering is some through drugs, some through alcohol, some through just indulging in sensual pleasures, plunging themselves into many sexual encounters, going to the movies, <laughs> going out for a good time with friends. But to all of these activities, though they might be blind and misguided, but they're seeking some kind of outlet some kind of release from suffering, discontent, disappointment, or even simple boredom. Now it's when one encounters the Dharma that one sees and investigates the Dharma, examines it through inquiry, through giving it a try, that one sees that this teaching has the potential to lead to true liberation, true release from suffering. And out of that recognition, that glimpse of understanding, there arises this quality of trust in the heart, the willingness to place trust in this teaching and to place trust in the teacher from whom this teaching flows, that is, to place trust in the Buddha, and then to place at least a provisional trust in those who represent the Dharma here in this world, especially, we say, the monastics, ordained monks and nuns, but also could be lay Dharma teachers who are qualified to teach the Dhamma. Okay, so when in the midst of one's confusion and constant disappointment and bewilderment, one encounters the Dhamma and this faith arises, this faith brings along with it this upsurge of joy in the heart. And that is 
the starting point of this process that will lead step by step to samadhi, to insight, to deeper levels of understanding, and then to liberation. Okay, but once this quality of faith arises initially, one has to find ways to strengthen that quality of faith. And one of the ways that I found personally to, to strengthen this quality of faith, and I found this over the years, a regular practice over the years, and this is the practice of a particular approach to meditation, which is called buddhanusati, the recollect, well actually there are several, three interwoven meditation subjects. One is buddhanusati, the recollection of the qualities of the Buddha. The second is dhammanusati, the recollection of the qualities of the Dharma. And the third is sanghanusati, the recollection of the qualities of the Sangha. But of these three, the one that I found particularly most useful for myself and that I've used most consistently over the years is the recollection of the qualities of the Buddha. <clears throat> and so in practicing this meditation, it's a much more discursive meditation than something like mindfulness of breathing. So it makes deliberate use of the faculty of thought in order to look into and investigate the qualities of the Buddha. So in the canonical text, we find actually the Buddha often recommends this meditation subject to his lay disciples and even to the monks, but particularly to the lay disciples. And so one practices the meditation subject by taking, there's a set of nine qualities of the Buddha often mentioned in the discourses. So these are, first I'll recite them in Pali and then give the translation. Itipiso Bhagava Arahang. So Arahang is Arahat which means one who is completely liberated from all defilements. The second, Sama Sambuddho, the perfectly enlightened one, the one who has understood the nature of all phenomena. Vija Charana Sampanno, one who possesses clear knowledge and excellent conduct. Sukato, the one who has arrived at the blissful state. Sugato, Loka Vidu, the knower of the world, the one who understands the nature of the world. Anuttaro Purisadama Sarati, supreme trainer of persons to be tamed. Sata Deva Manusanam, the teacher of deities and human beings. Buddha, the enlightened one. Bhagava, the Blessed One, the Exalted One, the Fortunate One. Okay, so in practicing this meditation, first one has to understand and study the meaning of these nine qualities. And then one runs the mind through these nine qualities over and over until one becomes, I say that it's like getting imbued, the mind gets imbued with the flavors of these nine qualities. And to use another simile, which on one past occasion had actual concrete results, I compare this practice of recollecting the nine qualities of the Buddha to having a plate with nine scoops of differently flavored ice cream. <laughs> I'm laughing because I taught this practice at a retreat at the Buddhist Insights Center in Rockaway. I think and I used that simile in the morning and then at lunchtime somebody had gone out 
and bought packages. We didn't have nine flavors, but there were about five different flavored ice creams. <laughs> okay, so as one runs over these qualities again and again with the mind, letting the mind dwell on them, you know, not running through them quickly and superficially, what one finds, and this is sometimes surprising, is that the mind becomes full of joy. It's sort of like one is opening up a spring where there seem to be just dry sand, and one is just, yes, yeah, just like dry sand or dry, or dry soil, and one has been digging, digging, and digging, and suddenly, with one dig of the shovel, one pulls the shovel away, and then water comes bubbling up to the surface. And so one knows one has hit underground a well. And so this is what happens as one uses the recollection of the Buddha. It brings up this quality of joy, starts bubbling into the mind. And this can be used to enrich the mind, to inundate the mind, and uplift the mind, and make the mind more and more happy, full of happiness. And so this is using faith and devotion as a means to uplift the mind. And as the mind becomes uplifted and full of this joy and delight, one could either continue on that same track to deeper stages of concentration, to samadhi, or at a certain point, one could then switch over to another meditation subject like mindfulness of breathing. Because now one has a strong base of joy in the wholesome, because one is delighting in the wonderful, magnificent, beautiful qualities of the Buddha himself. And similarly, one could do similar meditations using the qualities of the Dharma or the qualities of the Sangha as a basis. And one finds, if, I, if you want to know the references for these meditations, one could look particularly in Anguttara Nikaya, Book of Sixes, because there are altogether six recollections, Sutta number 10 and Sutta, I think it's number 24 or 25 maybe both of them. And what the Buddha says, what he's explaining, how this meditation subject works, sort of its mode of operation, he says that ordinarily the mind is overcome by lust, hatred, and delusion, the three unwholesome roots. But when one is turning the mind and fixing the mind on the qualities of the Buddha, one is focusing on a person who is completely free from lust, hate, and delusion. If one focuses on the Dharma, one is turning to the path that leads to freedom from lust, hate, and delusion. If one focuses on the qualities of the Sangha, one is focusing on those who have entered the path to the end of lust, hatred, and delusion. And so, by focusing on these objects, the mind, the greed or lust, hatred, anger, delusion of the mind, gradually settle down and the mind temporarily experiences a kind of opening, an opening in the wilderness, where or opening in the jungle or an oasis in the desert, a state temporarily free from lust, hate, and delusion. So that's a little bit like a foretaste of nirvana, the ultimate end of lust, hate, and delusion. And so in that brief, even if it's just for a few seconds or a minute or a few minutes, one is experiencing this joyful, blissful state. And that provides the strong supporting condition 
that strengthens one's faith and also propels one to go further on the path. Okay, so this is how faith is one of those qualities that contributes to joy in the wholesome. But there are other qualities that have to go along in order to provide what I call the strong and stable basis for the development of the path. Okay, the next strong supporting quality is, again I'll use the Pali word, sila. The word sila is what we translate ethical behavior, moral behavior, virtuous conduct, good conduct. So this expressed very concisely Sila is good bodily and verbal conduct. And how do we develop this good bodily and verbal conduct? The way to develop it is through the observance of precepts by undertaking certain rules of conduct that help us regulate our behavior in our day-to-day -day life and in this way by observing the precepts regulating our behavior we develop the good inner qualities that correspond to the precepts. Okay so for the lay community the Buddha has prescribed five precepts so these are the precepts to abstain from killing, not to kill living beings, and not to inflict any kind of physical harm upon them, not to steal, precept number two, not to misappropriate the belongings of others, third, not to commit sexual misconduct, not to commit adultery, seduction, uh, forcing minors into sexual activity, and so forth. To abstain from false speech, not to mislead others or deceive others with our speech, and to abstain from the use of intoxicants. So these are five precepts which seem very simple, very, very concise. But first, as one observes these precepts, in the first instance, it has beneficial impact upon others. Because when you undertake, just to take one, one precept as an example, when you undertake the precept to abstain from taking life, it means that no other sentient being has any reason to fear for their life in your presence. Similarly, when you undertake the precept to avoid stealing, no other person has any reason to fear that you're going to misappropriate their belongings. When you undertake the precept to abstain from sexual misconduct, nobody has any reason to fear that you are going to fear that you are going to break up their particular romantic relationships or impose on them in any kind of inappropriate ways. When you take the precept to speak the truth, everyone that you have dealings with can have confidence in your word. And the fifth precept, very important, when you abstain from the use of intoxicants, none of the kinds of damage and harm and injury and misconduct that arise from the use of intoxicants will occur. So these, the Buddha says that one who observes these five precepts gives safety and security to countless loving beings to all sentient beings. So that is the benefit that observing these precepts has for others. 
But observing these precepts also has immediate benefits for yourself. The first immediate benefit is that by observing these precepts, you avoid any kind of contact, cu conduct that's going to create unwholesome karma. Karma with the potential to ripen at some time in the future and bring harm and suffering to yourself. But also, as you observe these precepts regularly and consistently, they bring subtle, long-term changes in your character, in the makeup of your character. Because what does your character derive from, fundamentally? We could say that your character, your personality, is a kind of, say it's a complex, almost like a compound of your thoughts and volitions from one occasion to another to another. So the reason why we all have different characters is because we've all had different thoughts. And these thoughts, as they get woven together, they become a particular fabric. And so if you create a fabric out of bad cloth, bad threads, you're going to get a bad fabric. If you create a fabric out of good, thre good threads, good wool, good wool, good cotton, you'll have a good fabric. And so we create our char character out of our individual thoughts. And when you observe these precepts consistently, they are changing the way you think, changing your intentions, changing your volitions. And so in this way, over months and years, of generating wholesome thoughts that correspond to the precepts. You are changing your character in ways governed by these tendencies of the precepts. So the precept to avoid taking life is planting the seed of compassion in your character, concern for the well-being of other at least other human beings, but more widely, all sentient beings. To abstain from stealing is planting the disposition towards honesty and trustworthiness in your character. To abstain from sexual misconduct is planting the seed of inner respect, self-respect within your character. To abstain from false speech and to speak the truth is planting in your seed a strong commitment to truthfulness and honesty. And to abstain from the use of intoxicants is planting the disposition towards sobriety, which is the foundation for mindfulness and clear comprehension. And so by observing the five precepts, you are developing the strong foundation of the wholesome within your character. And you can turn back, and the Buddha actually recommends this, that you turn back and reflect on your observance of the precepts. And this becomes a means, a direct means for generating joy within the mind. So there are some suttas where the Buddha says that the disciple, the devoted disciple, reflects on his and her observance of the silas and thinks that in this population, actually if we just look out at the people today, we see, and it's so sad, so much violence, so much killing taking place, even in this country. Every day killing is taking place. Almost every week now we get these mass killings. It's reached a point where, especially around the weekends, I'm rather, whenever I open up on my, on my computer, open up the 
wor the national news, you know, click on that button that opens the international news. I'm almost anxious that I'm going to see a news report, mass killing in such and such a, pe such a, pl such a place. 10 people dead, 15 people pe dead, 20 people dead. And it goes on you know, on such a scale in this country, so much violence, and then not to speak about stealing, sexual misconduct, false speech, and so on. And so the Buddha says, the noble disciple reflects that in this population, and he's speaking back in ancient India in the fifth century BC, in this population, of people who have been gone astray through immoral conduct. I am observing these precepts unbroken, untorn, unblemished. These precepts that are liberating, praised by the wise, and that lead to concentration. And as one reflects on the precepts in that way, then it gives rise to joy and one can st strengthen that joy by repeatedly reflecting on the precepts even doing this just for one minute each day what i recommend especially for those of you who have already become confirmed buddhists each day before your altar or shrine you recite the three refuges you turn over in your mind or reflect on the qualities, the virtues of the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha, then you recite the five precepts and you turn back and reflect just for a couple of minutes that I am observing these beautiful, wonderful precepts prescribed by the Buddha, praised by the Buddha, taught repeatedly by the Buddha, these precepts that are liberating to the heart. And as you reflect on these precepts, even just one minute or two minutes, you'll see that, they, that this reflection brings a kind of jolt of joy into the mind, into the heart. Okay, so this is the, what I call the second way of generating joy in the wholesome. The first way is through faith, by recollecting the virtues of the Buddha, Dharma, the Sangha. The second is by undertaking the precepts and then reflecting on the precepts. The third basis, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> The third basis for generating joy in the wholesome is through the practice of generosity. That is the practice of giving. And the practice of giving originates from a particular quality or factor of the mind. In Pali, we have a technical word for that factor of the mind, chaga which is what we translate as generosity. So generosity is the quality of mind. The expression of generosity in action is giving, giving to others in some way. And so the reason that generosity becomes a basis for joy in the wholesome is that Generosity and the practice of giving is a way of breaking down the barriers that we set up sort of instinctively through a long-term con conditioned habit of erecting discriminations and barriers between myself and others. So we have this kind of wall where I'm sort of in my little house, which is really a prison cage here, and I'm looking out through the window, which is the window of the prison cage, at other people, 
and I see them in competition with myself, I see myself in competition with them, so we think of our life as a kind of zero-sum game where there's a prize up here and either they get it or I get it. And hell, they're not going to get it, I'm going to get it. So I have to elbow them and knock them out of the way in order to get the goodies for myself. So that is the way we ordinarily think when the mind is in the grip of greed and selfishness. And when I get the goodies for myself, and somebody suggests that I might share them with somebody else, okay, maybe in order to get to you know, win some praise from others, <clears throat> and maybe to rank up a few good points in the eyes of others, I might break off a little piece of the goodies that I possess and offer to somebody else. But usually the mind is sort of stuck in this attitude of clinging and attachment. And even though we think that this clinging and attachment of the goodies is the means for me to be happy, but when we really look deeply into it, we would see it's a cause of suffering, right? A kind of, you know, as I said, it's like being in a prison cage. And so the practice of generosity, even starting in a little way, it's like remove, removing one stone from that prison, like using your chisel. <laughs> when the prison guards are not watching, you take a hammer and a chisel, maybe somebody has smuggled it into you, and you start knocking at the stone of that prison cage till you remove one stone. Then you go a little further, you knock a second stone, a third stone, fourth stone, until there are enough stones removed to step out through the opening, and then you are free. And so the practice of generosity is a way of knocking down those barriers between yourself and others by generating a mind of kindness, a mind of compassion that is really can identify with others and is really intent on helping others and benefiting others. And so through that practice of generosity, you develop stronger and stronger bonds of solidarity with others, a deep identification with others. And so from this little, narrow, constricted ego mind, one develops the boundless, one is starting to develop a boundless, universal mind, a mind which can share in the happiness and suffering of others, at least through a material act of sharing something with others. And the Buddhist texts speak of different ways, means of practicing generosity. And so there is the giving of material things, but also the giving of the Dharma. So two ways to practice generosity. And even though we don't want to rank them and say one is better than the other, but the Buddha himself says that of all gifts, the gift, the best of all gifts, is the gift of the Dharma. And so maybe you think, but I'm not really so knowledgeable about the Dharma. I don't have the ability to write books on the Dharma or to give teachings on the Dharma. How can I give the gift of the Dharma? Well, one way you can give the gift of the Dharma is by supporting those who are qualified to give the gift of the Dharma. And so that is by giving to support to temples, monasteries, Buddha centers, and supporting them. <laughs> and so this would be supporting, for example, the purchase of this property to establish the new Buddhist insights, Home for Buddhist Insights, in giving monetary contributions to the purchase of that property 
you'll be indirectly giving the gift of the Dhamma. But when I speak about giving the gift of the Dhamma as being the supreme gift, we should not underrate the importance of giving material gifts, particularly in this world today where so many people are afflicted with poverty, homelessness, hunger. And so we should find opportunities to help in any way that we can. Of course, we have to have some consideration for our own means, but always look for opportunities to give, even if it's difficult, even if you have to struggle against that innate grasping tendency of the mind. Because what you find is that as you practice giving, giving little things, even with difficulty, when you give a little gift with difficulty, it creates a certain opening or disposition to give again in the future more generously. And then as you give more generously, it creates that disposition to give still more generously. So it's said that the person who becomes the fully enlightened Buddha has to practice as a bodhisattva for countless aeons, giving his own body, his own life, his own blood, his own organs, not to speak of external material things. But how did he get that capacity to give? It didn't come just sort of, he's born as a bodhisattva and he innately has those gifts, that, that, that skill. But it said way back in the distant past, he was selfish to miserlist, miserly also. But he practiced one little gift and he found happiness in that giving. And that encouraged him to give more, to give more, to give more, until he could give his own life, his own blood, his own organs, in one existence after another after another, joyfully, even looking for the opportunities to give his own life. Okay, so don't try, don't go out and start standing in front. I read years ago, and I think this was in Sri Lanka, there was a man who must have wanted to follow the way of the Bodhisattva. So he went to the zoo, the Colombo Zoo, and he jumped into the tiger cage, and he got mauled and killed by the tiger. So don't go to the zoo and think, I'm going to sacrifice my life for the lions or the tigers. The tigers and lions, I assume that they are well fed <laughs> in the zoo. <laughs> but keep your practice realistic and within your means here in our day-to-day -day interactions. Okay, so one practices generosity and then one uses that generosity. The practice of generosity is joyful in itself, but one could also turn the mind back on one's practice of generosity and use that as a theme of reflection. Not for the purpose, it's not a way of sort of patting oneself on the back and saying how wonderful I am, that I'm practicing generosity, and then wondering, oh, when are they going to put up a plaque in my honor? You know, this, uh, this gift was given by such and such a person. It's not for self-congratulations, but it's a way of reinforcing the joy in the wholesome by reflecting on one's generosity. So one turns back one considers the gifts one has given and rejoices in one's ability to have broken the barrier of selfishness and being able to share one's means in some way with others. And as one reflects in that way, then this current of joy starts to arise in the mind 
and gathers strength. So that is a means of generating joy in the wholesome. Okay, so we have faith, the observance of precepts, the practice of generosity. I'll mention another means of generating joy in the wholesome. And this is a quality that we use the Pali word, I'll use the Pali word mudita, which means altruistic joy or rejoicing in the good qualities and good deeds of others. Okay, now there's a kind of innate tendency in the human mind to put itself in this competitive relationship with others. So if one sees others doing something good, maybe there will arise this instinctive thought, spontaneous thought, how dare he do something good and become better than myself? I have to be number one. And if I see he's doing more good than I am, then I feel envious and resentful and maybe competitive. I have to start doing good, not because I really like doing good, but in order to surpass the other people. So that is the competitive mind and the envious and resentful mind. And so that becomes a big barrier. And we see that many people actually do a lot of good deeds, but not because they really take delight in good deeds, but because they want to win praise from others and to be esteemed by others. Okay, but when we see others doing good deeds, whatever their motive might be, the practice to overcome that, resent, that resentment and competitiveness is the quality called mudita, which is altruistic joy, rejoicing in the good deeds of others. And so this is done as a meditative exercise. But you don't have to do it as a full-time regular meditation, but you can do this just as part of a regular sort of routine, maybe at the end of your regular sort of sitting meditation period, you could start thinking about other people that you know, other friends who are living by the Dharma, practicing the Dharma, and then you rejoice in their goodness. Whatever kind of achievements they might have, whatever good qualities they have, whatever good practices they undertake, rejoice in those good deeds. And then you extend that goodness from the people that you know, from your friends, to any other people that you know about or hear about. If you hear about somebody on the news who has done a good deed, helping those in need, you rejoice in it. And by rejoicing, and then you start extending your joy, your altruistic joy, spreading it over the whole world, over continent, one continent, over the next continent, over the next continent. You don't have to take people that you know about, but you think whatever people there might be in this world who are doing any good deeds by way of generosity, by well, way of helpfulness to others, by way of their moral practice, by way of their inner qualities, I rejoice in their goodness. And you'll find that as you rejoice in the good deeds and good qualities of others, that it has a kind of resonance effect of causing joy to strengthen within yourself and become more and more solidly established within your own mind. Okay, I want to leave some time for questions. So just I'll re review these four 
I call these these four methods that we can utilize as part of our practice for generating joy in the wholesome. So the first, especially essential for those who are committed followers of the Buddha Dharma is faith. And faith is to be strengthened by the recollection of the virtuous qualities of the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. The second basis for generating joy in the wholesome is observing the precepts not just in a blind habitual way but by reciting the precepts daily and then reflecting back and rejoicing in one's own commitment to the precepts. Third is the practice of generosity, giving to others whether material things or the gift of the Dharma, directly or indirectly, and then reflecting back and rejoicing in your generosity. And the fourth is mudita, altruistic joy, rejoicing in the good qualities and good deeds of others, starting from your own circle of friends, spreading more and more widely, until you can rejoice in all of the good of all people, all beings, whether seen or unseen. Okay, so that is a kind of summary of the points that I've covered. Now I want to open the floor to any questions. Ron? Yeah, Yeah, good to see you. Yeah. Okay, how should we reflect? Okay, what I suggest first, as part of one's regular routine, one, this is like say, at the beginning of the day, just at the start of the day, one recites the three refuges, and then one recites the five, <coughs> the five precepts. Then either immediately after reciting the precepts, or later in the course of that meditation session, one just turns back and thinks, I am observing these five precepts which have such wonderful impact on others and on myself. And you could either turn, you could either take the precepts as a whole, not distinguishing them, or you could go through them individually thinking, I'm observing the precept of not taking life so that everyone in my, that I come in contact with is safe in my presence. How wonderful. And then one could generate joy. I'm observing the precept to avoid stealing so everyone in my presence could feel their property is safe. How wonderful. And in this way, one goes through each precept Rejoicing it in, the, in rejoicing in it individually, and it doesn't have to be long. It just even just for a few, a few seconds with each precept. Where do we find um, where do we find that in the sutra and the dharma? Is it such an important thing? Like when you say, by not killing, you create an atmosphere where people don't have to live in fear. Yeah. By not stealing, you create honesty. Where do we find the corollary? Okay. <laughs> like by not using intoxicants, okay. sobriety. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Actually, I have to say that I've worked that out in detail myself. Okay. But one finds, one finds something like this with the ten courses of wholesome action, which is a, a kind of a more elaborate version of the, of the five precepts. Okay, where you find this? On Guttara Nikaya, Book of Tens, you could try Sutta number 176. If you, if you don't have pen or paper, maybe somebody could write it down. And, 
When also, also, I could tell you also where you find it. In Majjhima Nikaya, Middle Length Discourses, Sutta number 41. Yeah. Where the Buddha speaks about each of the ten courses of wholesome action, it will go something like, here the noble disciple abstains from the destruction of life. He is one who has put down the rod and weapon. He dwells conscientious, compassionate for the well-being of all sentient beings. And, and the last question, you said the yeah. Dharma is the path, the Sangha are the people on the path. Yeah. So the Buddha is the teacher, yeah. or how, how, how would we look at the Buddha? How do we? Oh, the Buddha is the one who discovers the Dharma and teaches the Dharma. So you could say, the, in a way, you could say the Buddha is the source of the Dharma. I say in a way because also the Dharma ever exists, but the Buddha discovers the Dharma and teaches it. Because, yeah, so you could say the Buddha is the teacher of the Dharma, the supreme teacher of the Dharma. The Dharma is the path and the truth, and the Sangha is actually the community of those on the path and also those who have realized the truth at the end of the path. Do you have a question? I wondered if you can say a little bit about how this practice conditions the mind for stream entry. Okay, I wasn't going that far. <laughs> <laughs> for stream entry. Yeah. <laughs> okay, there are several ways to approach that. <laughs> Maybe you want to answer? <laughs> okay. I'm busy with Bhikkhu Bodhi Nusati. Excuse me? Lucidity, okay. Okay, so one could say <clears throat> Okay, so all of these practices I say are the means of generating the joy in the wholesome and then that joy serves as the basis for proceeding to tranquility or calmness of mind, out of that calmness or tranquility of mind there arises happiness or inner pleasure or blissfulness. Out of that, in that happy mind, that happy mind is the mind that becomes concentrated in samadhi. And then one uses that concentrated mind to investigate the nature of material and mental phenomena, the conditioned dharmas with insight. That is the knowledge and vision of things as they really are. And it's when that insight into the nature of things as they really are reaches a certain degree of maturity that one makes the breakthrough, what's called the breakthrough to stream entry. And so in this way these factors become the supporting conditions for the arising of that joy and so forth that supports concentration, that supports insight. And it's when this insight reaches maturity that stream entry is attained. Can you define stream entry? Can, Can you tell us what stream entry is? Yeah. The, the discourses of the Buddha speak about four levels of realization, which are the stages on the, we'll call these maybe the major mi milestones of the path to liberation. And so the final stage is the stage of arhatship. The arhat is the fully liberated person. But preceding the attainment of arhatship, there are three lower stages of the path. The first of these is called stream entry. 
Of course, that is the stage where one enters the stream of the path that carries one irreversibly to liberation with no turning back. And so that is stream entry. And stream entry, with the attainment of stream entry, one starts cutting off permanently the fetters that tie one to samsara, the cycle of birth and death. And then one starts moving, as I said, irreversibly towards liberation. That's the first stage, yeah. What's the second? Okay. <laughs> okay. The second is called what? You see, this, the stream enterer, if he doesn't go any further, has at most seven more existences within samsara. But if the stream enterer continues the practice and then reaches the next breakthrough, the next breakthrough is called the stage of once returning. At that stage, one, cuts, one, one weakens the defilement still more to the point where one comes back into this realm of existence only one more time. Okay, suppose the person at the stage of once returning is not satisfied with that, but continues the practice further and then reaches the next breakthrough, the third stage. With that breakthrough, one cuts off still more fetters to the point that one doesn't come back to this human existence anymore, but one takes rebirth in one of these higher divine realms of existence and attains final liberation there. That, is called, that stage is called the stage of non-returning because one doesn't come back to this world but one is not yet fully liberated, one is reborn into one of the divine realms and there attains liberation. Okay, then if the person who has reached the stage of non-returning is not satisfied with that and continues the practice, when they reach maturity, then when their practice reaches maturity, then it will cut off the remaining fetters or bonds and that then culminates in arahatship, the stage of final liberation in this very life. Okay, um, Carrie? Um, Bonte, so what is the difference between joy and a happy mind? Between? Between joy okay. and a happy mind. How, how do we explain yeah, okay. the difference between Yeah, okay, the, the, the difference between joy joyfulness and happiness. Yeah, joyfulness is, I would say it's a more, ex how to put this, it's accompanied by more excitability or more excitement. So the earlier stage is joyfulness, joy and delight, in which the mind is uplifted with delight but along with that delight, there's a certain kind of agitation or restlessness or excitement, which is, prevents the full settling of the mind in samadhi. And so that is why after delight, there comes the stage called tranquility, where the joyfulness sort of cools off, settles down, where the mind settles down and the joy is still present, but it loses that kind of excited or agitated quality. And then when it settles down, then it becomes happiness or blissfulness or pleasure. So it's now also, I mean, it's a positive, happy, joyful mind, but that excitation has vanished, has subsided. It's not sense pleasure, but in terms of, of the feeling tone, it's pleasant feeling. It's a kind of, now it's a kind of quiet, you know, a kind of quiet, uplifting pleasure in the mind. And is joy PT? Is that the PT that you spoke of? Yeah, actually I'm using the word, the word that I'm translating as joy is pamoja. 
and then delight is piti. But pamoja and piti are really basically the same, just two stages of the same quality. So it's really piti, but in the earlier stage, where it's just newly arisen, it's joy, and then when it becomes stronger, it turns into delight. Yes. I'm, try, I'm trying to, yeah, I'm fighting when you're saying uh, it's important to support the Dharma. And yeah. That is the most important. So I'm picturing a world where nobody is doing anything else except supporting the Dharma. You're trying to imagine a world like that? No, but I'm, I'm not trying to, but I go to, okay, so if everybody stopped, you know, um, trying to, to remove suffering or help, you know, human suffering yeah. through curing, you know, medical problems, so on and so forth, violence in the world, and just, you know, we, we all stop doing everything but supporting the Dharma. Yeah. I, I, if I imagine a world like that, I imagine people's lives being shortened, they're not going to find a cure for some, you know, malaria, they're not going to, mm. this is going to stop. Because no, we're going to why, be engaged why? in supporting the, supporting the Dharma if you can't, you know, talk yourself. If you can't what? If you can't, if you can't teach the Dharma. I, I don't think I'll live long enough that I will be able to learn enough about Buddhism to be yeah. able to yeah. do what you're doing yeah. or what some yeah. other people yeah, yeah. here have chosen, yeah. you know, to make, they've yeah. gotten good at. I'm much better at doing... I'm that person that's much better at, at serving people yeah. in another way yeah. than uh, the Dharma. Yeah. yeah, but I don't think at first, I, I don't think I ever said... I'm, gonna, I'm missing something. Yeah. I don't think I ever said the most important thing of all is to support the Dharma. I don't think I said that. Okay. Maybe I said it's important to support the Dharma, but I don't think I said the most important okay. thing is to support the Dharma. Okay. And, I, and also, a world in which people are practicing the Dhamma doesn't mean that everybody gives up everything else in order to practice the Dhamma full time. Maybe for that you would have to raise the hypothesis. Let's imagine a world in which everybody, all the men become monks, all the women become nuns. Okay, what's a world like that like? Okay, a world like that completely undesirable because there'll be nobody to work in the hospitals, yeah. nobody to um, work in offices, nobody developing new versions of software. We can't take a flight anywhere since there's no airplanes <laughs> unless we have monks who are, tra who are trained as <laughs> Jet pi airplane pilots <laughs> and the bhikkhunis are trained to be air hostesses <laughs> and when you get if your car has to be repaired well who's ma manufacturing the cars anymore okay so okay so if we have a world, everybody becomes monks and nuns, undesirable in many ways. So do we say, therefore, n nobody should become monks, nobody should become nuns? Because no, not everybody's going to do that. Okay, a world, everybody has become a medical doctor. <laughs> okay, suddenly the medical, the medical schools are filled, turning out thousands and thousands and millions and millions of doctors, but there's nobody to build the hospitals. <laughs> yeah, so just, you know, let's say we're never going to get worlds like that. <laughs> so what I say is that it's important to support the Dhamma. I'm not saying that it's, <laughs> that we should, Everybody should devote all of their time to supporting the Dharma and not do, not do anything else. So, one should do what that one... It, that it brings the greatest joy to support the Dharma. Well, it brings the great joy. I, I helped a kid, you know, he's gonna, you know, and I, I felt better than the support that I do give to the Dharma. Yeah. 
to, yeah. to, to the Dharma. You know, yeah, um, okay, there are many, yeah. uh, many ways of, of doing good deeds, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And I'm taking it apart, but I'm yeah, yeah. so Okay, so please. Yeah, you know, there's a machine here that's making a lot of noise. Maybe if you, sub- or if this, or maybe if you just can come up and. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it certainly is not necessary to become a monk or a nun in order to practice the Buddha Dharma. There, the Buddha has taught the Dharma in many different ways for different people in different stations in their life, living under different conditions. So there's monastic practice, lay practice, a certain degree of overlap between the two, and then certain practices, particular specific to the monastics, particularly the monastic precepts, different precepts for lay people. Okay, what I say is never think I've come into the Dharma too late in life and then never think, okay, for that reason I've come so late, no reason to start practicing the Dharma here in this life. What one should reflect, in fact, this is another way maybe of generating joy and strengthening one's commitment, is that, as you said, the Dharma is so beautiful, so precious, so valuable, Think, even if you've come to the Dharma late in life, think, it's been such a wonderful gain for me that, you know, look around, you know, we see millions and millions of people, it's sort of like the Dharma is just staring them in the face, even, I have to say, in Buddhist countries, but they never really take up the practice of Dharma. So, many, so often, you know, I lived in Sri Lanka for many, many years, Sri Lankan Buddhists will say to me, you know, I grew up in a Buddhist family um, and we always, the family, we always went to the temple on the Buddhist holidays, but for me, just until recently, it was just a kind of traditional culture, religious culture, and I didn't really come to appreciate the Dhamma just until recently, maybe somebody, one of my friends gave me a booklet or I happened to hear a discourse on the Dhamma and suddenly I realized how valuable the Dhamma is. So don't think, you know, in Buddhist countries that all of the people who are traditional Buddhists are really followers of the Dhamma. I'd say probably percentage I don't like to give percentages, but let's say it's probably a pretty small percentage of people in traditional Buddhist countries who are serious Dhamma followers, practitioners. Uh, is it necessary to have an unwavering faith in rebirth? This is what, what I say. Rebirth is a central pillar of the Buddha's teaching. So, like, 
disagree with those who say the teaching of rebirth is part of ancient Indian culture that the Buddha just happened to take on board because that was the culture into which he was born. Um, and now in modern Western Buddhism, we're so more sophisticated, we have modern science, so we could just discard this ancient Indian religious culture. So I don't agree with those ideas. But what I say is that if one doesn't have that conviction in the truth of rebirth and the reality of rebirth, don't think that that should be an obstacle to one's practice of the Dhamma. What I say is keep an open mind and put one's skeptical doubt sort of aside, not feeling that one has to force oneself to a decision, and just take up the practices that one can find to be beneficial to oneself. But I would say also that if one wants to come to an understanding of the Dhamma, that <clears throat> it's important not just that one practices some type of meditation, but that one also studies the teaching of the Buddha. And then one will see how this whole structure of the Dhamma, how the teaching of rebirth and the working of karma is an integral part of the structure of the Dhamma. Yeah, so maybe sort of as an approach to take, as long as one has that hesitation, do, do you know the sutta called the Kalama Sutta? Okay, it's, you could, it's a very popular, it's become a very popular sutta. It's in the Anguttara Nikaya, but if you, even just if you search for it online, K-A-L, Kalama, K-A-L-A-M-A, -A Kalama Sutta. So here, the Buddha is on his wandering tour, and he comes to this, town where the people who are called Kalamas, they come to the Buddha and they say that many, <coughs> many teachers come to our town and they each give their own teaching and they knock down the teaching of the others and so we're completely confused, we don't know which way to turn. And so the Buddha says, it's right for you to be confused, don't go upon what's handed down by tradition, don't go by what you've heard from others. Don't feel that you have to compel what is written down in the sacred texts, but what you know for yourselves, that is what you should accept. And then he leads them through a questionnaire so they could see that greed, hate, and delusion are unwholesome and causes of unwholesome behavior that leads to harm and suffering and that the absence of greed, absence of hatred, absence of delusion, and brings happiness here and now, <coughs> and results in wholesome patterns of behavior that bring happiness. And so for the Kalamas, he says, as long as you have these doubts, just accept the, this principle, to work to overcome greed, hate, and delusion, and to observe good modes of conduct. I say one could take the precepts even if one has skeptical doubts about the reality of rebirth. Because one is still using those precepts as guides to one's own conduct. So in a way the precepts are a part of an, en an entrance to, oh, this, to this path. Oh, definitely. Even if you're not so far along. Yeah, yeah. The precepts are certainly the entrance. A guide to live by. Yeah, certainly the precepts are, a, as you put it, a guide, guide to right conduct. This idea that it seems like the Buddha taught in different ways to different people, yeah, yeah. and the Kalamas obviously were not his students. At that point, they were not his students. Yeah. And and uh, would you say that they are in the category of uninstructed worldlings? So the Buddha is giving advice to people who really don't know what the Dhamma is. Yeah, these are people who come who don't know what the Buddha's Dhamma is. And so he's teaching them in a way that is in line with his Dhamma. So the <clears throat> sort of the aim of the Buddha's teaching is to overcome, to eradicate 
greed, hatred, and delusion. And so he's not yet teaching them you should eradicate greed, hatred, and delusion since they don't yet have sufficient trust or confidence in him. But he's teaching them that greed, hate, and delusion, you could see for yourself, are harmful qualities of mind. And the absence of greed, hatred, and delusion, when greed, hatred, and delusion are absent in the mind, then the mind is well and happy. So I've often wondered why Buddhist teachers will use that teaching to Buddhist practitioners as if they were uninstructed in the Dhamma. You know, like it's a kind of, like this is the reason why you don't have to believe in certain things about the Dhamma. Like yeah. Buddha was talking to people who really yeah. had no experience with the Dhamma. Isn't it a shame to say that to people who are, have been studying or practicing? Does that <laughs> seem like it doesn't fit? Or if I no, I understand what you mean. Um, You see, I think people who read the Kalama Sutta, either they misunderstand it themselves or else teachers who don't believe in rebirth or who want to put the teaching of rebirth aside or to get others into the Dhamma without having to come to that hurdle of rebirth will present the Kalama Sutta as if the Buddha is, say, is teaching his own disciples. But that is not the case. The Kalamas, the Buddha just came across this community by chance on his arms round. And they were confused and didn't know who to believe, what to believe. So if the Buddha said, okay, don't believe the earlier teaching, teachers that you met, believe me. And then gave his own teaching exactly the way he would give it to his disciples. Then he would just be imposing his trip on them. So he's saying that we could put all of this aside whether there's rebirth, no rebirth, and so on. But just as a starting point, let's start with what you could see for yourself and verify for yourself. Do you have any advice on restoring faith? On? Restoring the factor of faith. Restoring it. I mean, somebody who has had faith and then the faith. <laughs> what I think, what I find strength for me strengthens the quality of faith. Not that it deteriorated for me, but what has reinforced it is reading the discourses. Because one sees that, that the discourses, that they're so clear, realistic, wise, practical, even I would say contemporary in their way of thinking, that for me, it doesn't need like these emotional practices or devotional practices, but often it's a, this intellectual approach of seeing how clear, straightforward, logical, reasonable, practical, realistic the Dhamma is that, for me, strengthens the faculty of faith. Yeah, please. Um, returning to the earlier question about uh, rebirth, is a belief in rebirth a necessary precondition for liberation? Or if one believes in rebirth, but it's not at the forefront of their practice, say, if, uh, if, if um, it's just as beneficial to practice generosity towards others you can help others in this lifetime rather than concerning yourself with helping a self in a future lifetime. Uh, so is, I guess, returning to the original phrase in the question, is a belief in rebirth uh, necessary for liberation or can one kind of supplant that with helping I think that there are several questions here. Let's, let's disentangle them. Okay, first, is a belief in rebirth necessary for liberation? I think I would not accept the phrasing of the question in that it seems to imply like a little bit, I, don't, I didn't come from a Catholic background myself, but I used to hear 
from my Catholic friends, what they would be taught in Catholic school. If you want to get to heaven, you have to believe in the, doc in the doctrine of the Trinity. You have to believe in the Holy Ghost. It, and I remember when I was a kid, we used to hear my Catholic friends would talk about the Holy Ghost. And I would think about the ghost movies, and there would be like a ghost will come. I would be sitting up late in my bed at night, wondering, is the Holy Ghost going to come into my bedroom? Okay, so it would be like, if you want to get to heaven, you have to believe this. So it's not like, if you want to get liberation, you have to believe in rebirth. But it's rather that I would say that a practitioner who's reached a certain stage in the development of insight will start seeing things so clearly that they would have no doubt anymore in the Buddha. And they'll know that since the Buddha is the one who has taught this whole framework of karma, what are the, karma, the different types of karma, what are the results of those karma, that they would just not have any doubt about the Buddha's teaching on karma and rebirth. And so, even before they got, long before they got to stream entry, just as the insight starts to deepen, that confidence and trust in the Buddha would become so clear and strong that they would have no reason for doubting anymore. So that is the question, is it necessary to have belief in rebirth for liberation? So then there was something else you were saying about for the practice of generosity. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, in this lifetime, we see that helping others liberate yeah. one's own mind as well as others' yeah. minds yeah. and yeah. lives. Um, uh, I'm wondering if a schema of, say, liberating others in this lifetime can be just as useful as a schema of liberating oneself in a future lifetime? Let's say the practice of generosity doesn't depend, in any, certainly doesn't depend on, in any way on a belief in rebirth and karma, but one can practice generosity very freely, abundantly, joyfully, just out of the joy of helping others and benefiting others. And that will, as I say, will give joy to one's own mind. So that is, I mean, it's part of the process or path to liberation, though this is a part which is directly visible here and now, and it doesn't require a base, any basis in the belief in karma and rebirth, but it's a directly visible kind of happiness and joy here and now. And just coming back to this matter of rebirth, I should mention that there have been like these scholarly, even scientific investigations done by, especially by a professor who had been at the University of Virginia, Ian Stevenson, into cases of children who have recollections of, past, of a past life, of their immediately preceding past life. And he's compiled many, many books of these cases. And then there's recently a book by a, a German Buddhist monk written in English, Venerable Analio, Biko Analio, which sums up a lot of the research of this professor, Ian Stevenson was his name. So if you don't want to read the detailed case studies, Venerable Analio has a book, I think it's just called Rebirth and, it's, and Buddha. If you search, do you know the exact title of that? I'll look it up for Yeah. Rebirth and the Buddha's teaching, or rebirth and the Buddha's teaching, something like that. So he sums up the research of this uh, Professor Ian Stevenson. Wow, it's 9.20. So any, uh, yeah. I just want to say thank you so much um, for your teaching today. Um, I had the experience um, of doing walking meditation. Yeah. And very quickly into a blissful, peaceful state. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, but it's like I had to do walking meditation to get <laughs> to feel that joy. So now, with your teaching tonight, I have a lot more to work with. 
Yeah, you could use these different, yeah. And you don't have to do these over, and certainly you shouldn't push oneself or force oneself to do these if it causes strain in the mind. But you could choose any of these and do it just for a few minutes as a way of uplifting the mind. And if you find that it helps to generate that joy, then you could ex gradually extend the time that you devote to that. Rebirth in early Buddhism and current research. Yeah, okay, so it combines both aspects. Rebirth in early Buddhism. So there he, I think this is in the first chapter, first two chapters, he looks at the role of rebirth in relation to the Buddha's own teaching. Then the later chapters, he summarizes the research of Ian Stevenson. And then Ian Stevenson passed away, I think, early in this century, but he has a student of his who's now a professor is continuing his type of re research. His name is Jim Tucker. I think he's also at University of Virginia now. Okay, maybe we should bring things to an end. And there's one other way of generating joy in the wholesome, which we're going to do now. And this is sharing the merits of one's practices. So in Buddhism, it's believed that when we engage in, in any kind of wholesome practices, we create good karma. And then we don't want to sort of accumulate or hold on to that karma and sort of put it into our personal karmic bank account you know, with a combination lock code over it. That, Nobody else can find the combination to get into my private karmic account. But we want to share that good karma, wholesome karma, abundantly. And so we're going to share the merits of teaching the Dharma, listening to the Dharma, share these merits with abundantly with all beings. And so first, let us think of any good karma that we have created today through our activity here. Through teaching the Dharma, listening to the Dharma, and think of any other good karma that you might have created in the course of this day. And then think of people all around the world, all of our fellow human beings. Maybe you could start off thinking of <coughs> your relatives and close friends. And with your mind, ask them to rejoice in your good karma. Even though they don't know what you're doing, but just mentally sort of send wholesome thought signals to them. May they rejoice in my, my good karma, and by so rejoicing, may they receive the benefits. Okay, then think of acquaintances, maybe people that you work with, your neighbors. People that maybe the clerks in the shops where you go shopping. Other people, other people that you just barely know and you think may all of these neighbors and acquaintances share in my merits. And may share, by sharing in these merits, may they receive benefits. Then extend your mind over the entire planet Earth. Think of the people, 7.2 billion people in five or six continents. 
and generate the thought, the wish. May all of the human beings on this planet rejoice in my merits. By so rejoicing, may they receive benefits. And then there are living beings in other realms of existence, some visible to us like the animals, others invisible to us and generate the wish may all sentient beings in all realms visible and invisible share in my merits and by so sharing may they receive may they receive abundant benefits And as you're extending those good thoughts, I'll recite some verses in Pali for sharing the merits. Akasa ta chabuma ta deva naga mahitika punyantam anumoditva chirangra kantu sasanam. Akasa ta chabuma ta Deva Naga Mahidika Punyantang Anumoditva Chirangra Kantu Desanam Akasa Ta Chabuma Ta Deva Naga Mahidika Punyantang Anumoditva Chirangra Kantu Mangparam Eta Vatacham Hehi Sampadam Punya Sampadam Sabe Deva Anumodantu Sabe Bhuta Anumodantu Sabe Sata Anumodantu Sabha Sampati Siddhya Pavagupadaya Vichy Heta To E Tanta Re Satakayupapanna Rupi Arupicha Sanya Sanino Dukha Pavuchantu Pusantu Nibhuting Okay, thank, <laughs> thank you again for your attention. And again, please remember that this is a benefit, I was, I was going to say a benefit concert, <laughs> <laughs> a benefit a talk for the Buddhist Insights, the new meditation center. So please open your hearts and to the extent that you reasonably can to help to support their efforts to acquire this new property. Okay, thank you and thank you for thank you. And we